everyone. I uh, want to welcome our members who can join us live. Uh, we will have this uh, available for replay later. And if you have any questions, you can raise your hand uh, with the reaction icon at the bottom, or you can enter it in the chat. Please feel free to interrupt us at any time. I'd love to have a, a live dialogue, and you don't have to wait to the end to answer, ask your questions. So today, I'd like to welcome a long-term trader, Michael Katz, to the Chat with Traders community, uh, who has some experiences he'd like to share with us. Uh, welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of uh, Chat with Traders, so it's a great honor to be on the show. Yeah, great. Uh, share with us a little bit about your your background, um, what what got you interested in financial markets and um, from the beginning. Yeah. So my uh, romance with the, the stock market started when I was uh, in my early 20s. I finished the military service and then my ex-girlfriend at the time uh, or my girlfriend at the time uh, bought me the uh, the book Robert Kusaki book uh, you know rich dad poor dad and back then it just blew my mind cuz um, I didn't know anything about the stock market and the idea that I can you know basically trade from my computer at home and make a living out of it was uh, an amazing uh, concept. Um, as a child, I was all into playing uh, computer games. So I spent hours and hours doing that, mostly one person shooter. So, you know, I used to skip breakfast, lunch and dinner just to sit and uh, and play those games. So bringing those, those set of skills that I had there to the trading platform, uh, that was uh, a good thing for me. Mm. Yeah. So, so did you feel uh, more attracted to uh, the kind of day trading, short-term trading, because it's it it had some similarities to like a video game? Or the reason why I asked that is because uh, Robert Kiyosaki, um, he tends to be more of kind of a, a buy and hold, like a right. longer term investor. And yeah, uh, so... But it got me into the general, um, you know, idea of what is stock market. And then I took two years. I understood that, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to jump in. So I took two years of my life, um, basically worked as little as I could, you know, just to pay the bills. But I took those two years to learn about the stock market and about trading. As soon as I started to understand that there are, uh, certain types of trading like day trading swing etc um i automatically moved to day trading uh, for a few reasons one of them definitely was the computer gaming i knew that i'm, I'm fast on the keyboard i like to do and act uh, fast in real time and also uh, the idea that you don't need to hold any position overnight so you're not exposed to crazy things that happening in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you first started, uh, trading equities on, is that right? Did you trade, uh, commodities or, uh, no, no, uh, stock market, the U S market, uh, mm -hmm. all, all the way equities, day trading. It took me roughly seven years to go into futures as well. And till this day, I'm still trading uh, futures as well, mostly indices, uh, the NQ and the ES. But those usually are um, a little bit longer term than day trading. And it's still in the two, three days of holding, not something that I will invest in. Mm. Well, yeah. What was the year that you first got started? Mm, it was like... When I first started, it was I was 21, so it's 19... Uh, yeah 18 years ago so if we in the mat it was yeah. a long time ago and then i had those two years when i just sat and learned everything i could i didn't trade those two years i did and when i took that uh, two years off i didn't trade i just sat and learned anything that i can grab basically i read a lot of books you know uh, john murphy uh, bible and uh, everything that i uh, could have found uh, online not a lot of um, information back then, at least. You couldn't find a lot of, um, you know, information about trading. Not like today, at least. 
so um, just said learn learn how the whole process of the stock market works and and you know um, the mental side of it what takes what it takes to become a, a successful day trader and all of those things so um, after those two years I then started to trade and yeah it was 16 years ago 15 16 years ago Mm, well, yeah, I remember uh, during that time, uh, we had some nice trending markets. Uh, uh, and uh, yet you found um, you found day trading to be attractive enough and potentially profitable enough for you uh, to yeah. stick with that as opposed to um, more of a, a swing trading. I mean, I did some swing trading here and then, mm -hmm. um, but it's not appealing as day trading. I don't know. I got to, I got to have the, um, you know, you got to do what you love to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you, mm -hmm. and if, if I'm doing swing trading, I don't really care so much about it as uh, in day trading. Cause in day trading, you leave the chart, you, you know, you, you see it in real time, you make decisions in real time. So those kind of things drive me at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so early on, did you, um, like many traders, did you end up having a lot of challenges early on and uh, having losses early on, or were you blessed by, uh, or cursed, depending on how you look at it, by early <laughs> profits? Right. No, I lost money. But the thing is, um, since I had those two years of preparation, mm -hmm. I did it really, I gave everything in those two years. So since I have had this uh, preparation, when I first started, I knew that I'm going to lose money. So mm -hmm. it always was in the back of my mind. I knew that I'm not going to, you know, make this Ferrari in uh, two months of trading. So um, I risked uh, much less than most traders usually do, like $50 a trade at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It took me six months to lose uh, $2,000. Mm -hmm. That it's also decent compared to... A lot of trading that you know usually blow their account in the beginning but that's only because i have a very strong uh, foundation and preparation um i didn't trade demo at the mm -hmm. beginning i just you know i jumped to the water to the pool and um but risking not too much in order not to blow the account mm -hmm. so after those six months i started to understand a little bit more what i want to do what type of um, day trader i want to become at least at that time obviously you know when you're trading as you know when you're trading a lot you're actually changing your personality and changing your uh, type of trading right sometimes you are a scalper sometimes you are um hold you know holding the positions till the end of the day um, sometimes it's momentum trading, sometimes it's trend, trend following, counter trend, and all of those things. So um, it's never, it's like an ending, it's never ending um, road, right? Or trip. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, did you switch between a lot of different technical indicators early on, or was your biggest challenge uh, just the risk management side? Right. So I'm not a big fan of indicators generally speaking because you know at, at the end most all indicators coming from either volume or price so um, i was very keen into just focusing on price and volume it was my main goal um, other than that i tried some of those you know the emas and i'm still using the macd but i tried a lot of them at least learned a lot of them, uh, ADX and RSI, all of those things. So uh, from time to time, I might be using them, but not on a regular basis and also uh, not giving them the most, uh, you know, as much as um, usually uh, traders like to use because you will see, um, obviously I, I um, taught a lot of, tutor a lot of uh, traders during my uh, trading session, uh, trading career. And basically, I saw some traders that just have like 10 indicators on the chart, mm -hmm. you know, all of them. And I don't believe in it. And I don't really like it, though. Mm, I see. But, so today, uh, do you have 
any particular indicators that you would claim as your favorite, or are you very just loosely uh, watch them uh, and not take too much stock in them? Are you mostly just kind of look at the chart and the volume and and make your right. trades off what you see visually? It's ninety percent volume and uh, and price, and let's say ten percent uh, MACD MACD. Mm -hmm. Definitely my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so did you trade, um, for how many years did you trade your own money? I, I'm just curious, did you ever get into trading? Um, did you tell your friends or family about this? Uh, did they ever ask you or did you offer to uh, trade their money for them? For you? Yeah, for I uh, got to that point. It took me probably four or five years until I decided um, to try and trade uh, other people's money. Uh, obviously, at the beginning, family and friends. Um, you know, the, it's kind of hard to start trading when it's not your own money and it's your friend's money or family, you know, parents or um, cousins and stuff like that because you feel a lot of obligation, right? And But on the other end, because it's not your money, you're also... A little bit more focused and want to prove yourself and sometimes when you're trading your own money you let loose on the um, on the small things that that are important in the trading so um yeah so i started trading on their money um actually that was probably the main point when i pushed myself uh, to become a better trader and more profitable and all of those Mm, I see. Uh, so did they, I mean, did you end up sharing with them prior to managing the money? Did you end up sharing with them what you're doing and how they're doing? And they came to you and say, hey, can you manage my money? Or were you uh, voluntarily asking them or uh, say, uh, suggesting to them, hey, I can manage your money for you? I mean, they saw me doing that. So they mm -hmm. did ask um, for me to manage their money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't share a lot of information because, uh, you know, trading is a very lonely, um, um, what it's called, um, like a job, uh, right, occupation. So um, you usually stick to yourself, maybe share with your wife or something like that. But most of the times you tell your friends, that's what I do. And they ask you sometimes, should I invest in this on that? And uh, I usually tell them, don't do anything, you know, don't, don't go and invest in something that you don't really know and completely understand. And especially, you know, there was times that friends came to me and just told me, okay, I have like a um, hundred K to invest in. Should I invest in the stock market? So my first uh, question was how much out of uh, this hundred K are you willing to lose? Mm -hmm. And obviously, everyone, everyone said, um, I'm not willing to lose anything. So I'm <laughs> telling them, this is not the place for you. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, I, I, uh, I remember uh, I've managed uh, money for friends and family before, and I found uh, that psychologically, uh, it made it difficult for me to take um, the same level of risk that I would with my own portfolio. And a lot of times I would end up uh, second guessing the trades because I I would thought always thought about the loss the potential loss and as a result so much of the time I just kept them in cash and uh, um, so it was a little embarrassing sometimes that uh, you know months would go by and I wouldn't even put them in a trade so uh, yeah that feeling of not wanting to um, let them down I think it's a big factor at least for me anyway yeah yeah I can totally understand that yeah. Mm. We, uh, we as trader goes to a lot of processing, mental processing during our trading, right? Right. So uh, during these early years uh, and when you were um, trading with their money, uh, did you have anyone else to trade with? Uh, were you just uh, working solo? Uh, did you ever uh, have any job or be around other traders in any form or capacity? In those years, no, I was mm. completely by myself just sitting in front of the computer trying to get the most uh, out of it. Um, I used, when when I first started, I used to work just, you know, random 
jobs just to, just so I will have the time to trade, right? So um, I kept that basically as soon as I continued to trade and, become, and became profitable, I just um, set like almost the whole day in front of a computer, continuing to crafting my uh, trading, basically, you know, recapping the trades, uh, trading journals, all of the, um, all the charade. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did, um, how did you do in 2008 during the great financial crisis? Did you just stick with your uh, day trading? I mean, did you, uh, how were you impacted one way or the other? Yeah, that, I always continued with day trading. Mm -hmm. um, the Corona time, 2016, like the end of 15. Um, you know, these days, these days. So, also in the uh, in the bear market, I just started actually trading there. So it was basically uh, for me. It was still not completely understandable, I guess, because. I started trading, uh, I understood what I'm supposed to do, but the market was a bit rough for me at least. So that was a good uh, dive in moment because, you know, uh, it made me think or craft my trading a little bit more, I guess, than just going in and you have uh, a bull market that anything you do will work. Mm -hmm. But on a bear market, you need to be a little bit more, I guess, um, I don't know if on the safe side, but understand the, the charts a little bit more. Maybe that also was the reason that I became uh, more a short uh, trader than a long trader. Um, like it took me, I guess, probably eight years or so to start uh, buying stocks and not just shorting them, oh. you know, like percentage wise, at least. Uh huh. So, uh, did you become more attracted to shorting stocks as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, or were you attracted to shorting uh, before then? No, no, hundred percent because of the financial market. Yeah, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the, the market was collapsing at that time. So you know, it just it's it was I'm not saying easier, but it, to trade, but at least easier to recognize the the patterns, the the price section, and probably because of that, it led me also to become a few years later become a counter trend uh, trader and not a trend following. So what I used to do uh, is just shorting. You know, um, the day start uh, gapping down, the stock is gapping down, pulling back. Uh, toward closing the gap and then I'm shorting it or just you know consolidating creating like a bear flag and then shorting it but um, as as time goes uh, went by we I basically started to buy the dips and that's uh, until today is the the most profitable uh, trading technique that I have just buying the dips oh so buying the dip is the most profitable trading technique uh irrespective of market conditions, whether the market was in a strong uptrend or in the last you know, year or so in a downtrend, is that strategy you found effective in both bull and bear markets? Yeah, most definitely. If not buying the dip, selling the top, but basically since I used to look at short, like, like stocks that are dropping down, I used to analyze them. And then in time, I used to saw the bounce up, right? And so it took me a while to start buying the dip, but I already saw the pattern and the behavior of the market behavior uh, from when the price is dropping down and then reaching a support level and then bouncing up. So in time, I started to buy the dip and basically that's what led me to it. Um, the thing is, you know, we have a bear market, a great bear market right now. But also in the corona, when we had a nice moment to move to the upside, I mean, after those two or three months of the downside, we, you can still buy the dip because uh, in, the, in this way, you know, stocks are still gapping down. And because of the momentum, the, um, the bull momentum, they usually will pop up. And this is where you enter. 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you focus in on particular stocks or sectors and get to know them really well? Or do you jump across all kinds of sectors and different stocks, whichever happens to be moving up or down during that day? Right. So I guess at least for the last year, uh, I would be focusing on more of um, the SPY and the, the NASDAQ, the QQQ, just because they're super volatile and you know, you, you don't need to do anything else besides focusing on the market. When you have a, when you have a strong market, when you have a um, volatile market, you can just stick with the market. Uh, but other than if you exclude exclude uh, this year, I would every day I would have you know go to my scanners, find the um, the most um, active uh, stocks either uh, by volume, arvol. Uh, gapping up, gapping down, the news, the catalyst that moving uh, those stocks and all of those things. So it could be that I'm trading, uh, you know, BABA -B -A today, but tomorrow or yesterday I traded something completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, could you share with us uh, some of your big losses, uh, how they happened and mm -hmm. what did you learn from them? Yeah, I, I mean, I have the the one big loss i guess every trader have it right mm -hmm. um it was not too long ago so that was i don't know i guess it's a positive thing because you know i already knew what i'm doing as a trader i did let myself cross the lines or the rules that i had and i guess so i guess it wasn't pay, painful as it would have been if it was let's say in the first two years i learned a lot from it obviously and i uh, managed to overcome it uh, pretty much quickly like six months it took me uh, to return this so it was on um, the symbol uh, spce so space mm -hmm. um forgot the name of the owner uh, mm -hmm. richard uh, bredson maybe mm -hmm. right virgin atlantic mm -hmm. so um, I took a long, it was pre-market, I entered um, uh, the trade, I was up uh, roughly $2,000 right at the beginning before the opening bell, and that was a great start for me. I didn't cover anything. When, uh, when the bell rang, the price of the stock dropped down dramatically. So what I usually do is, uh, like most traders, I guess, basically adding more averaging down of course and this is i guess important to say when you're averaging down you still have to do um a calculation of the risk right you don't want to go all in and then average down you want to enter with uh, a quarter of your position and then when it's dropped down and reach a major support level let's say or whatever it is that um any trader works with then you add more and et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to fully expose yourself right at the beginning. So what I did is, is adding more to my position in, a, in probably a, roughly an hour in the trading game, in the trading session, I still call it a game, trading session. The I'm trading, back then I traded with, still have an account with them, uh, interactive brokers. So what I did, uh, what the broker did is basically dropped my um, leverage, my buying power from six to two. So mm. instead of having uh, six times my, uh, my portfolio, now I'm having only two. And in this case, I couldn't add more to my position. So I couldn't basically average down. Now, uh, roughly after uh, two, yeah, two hours, I was down 25K. Um, and I, and I said to myself, I remember it kind of clearly. I said to myself, okay, either you go out right now or you at least cover some of the loss. So you will have enough buying power again to buy and average down and basically, uh, yeah, average down the price. So I did that instead of adding out, um, I had this confidence and I guess this is I guess that was the problem. I had this confidence that, that I can win that trade, you know, get it back. And again, we're talking about like three years ago or something like that. So I was 
all into trading. I knew what I'm doing basically, and I still let let myself uh, loose in that case. So uh, I fought my way, you know, covering some of the the position, adding more, covering more, and again the the price is just melting down. They they selling it like crazy. Uh, I held it for the for the same day. Opened the the next day. It was uh, Thursday uh, Tuesday. Held it and continued to fight my way out. I couldn't. I was down like forty or sixty k. And then on Wednesday, I went to a friend and to trade from his place. He, he got a nice place in Tel Aviv, so I went there to trade with him. He's also a trader, and I remember. I guess it was the time six in my time. It's six p.m. So in the in New York is like um, eleven eleven a.m. I'm clicking my mouse key, closing the the position with a loss of a hundred k, almost hundred k. It was shocking. Obviously, it took me at least two weeks to to just touch the the screen again and the mouse key <laughs> because it was. It was rough, but you know, I was kind of devastated that I couldn't get back and uh, really win that trade because I I knew what I'm doing, so it didn't make any sense that I can't win that trade. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. understand what I'm trying to yeah. say? Yeah, it sounds like if if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you uh, like so many traders um, came under the influence of of um, you know the common psychological issues that we face uh whereas oh yeah i i know what i'm doing i can win it back and then that um uh that sensation that feeling um overrode your um your rules is that accurate yeah pretty much pretty much mm. Uh, mm. yeah so i, I went back uh, after those two weeks then started to analyze the trade it was if you looked at the chart there was so many entries and exiting those mm -hmm. three days. It mm -hmm. was really, I don't know how much money I paid in the commission, but it was a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I looked at the charts, uh, uh, analyzed it, you know, trying to understand what I did wrong uh, technical, uh, technically and, of course, uh, mentally. And, uh, yeah, from there, uh, there was a, a friend of mine that uh, actually helped me to get back on the horse. He wasn't a trader, but he it was like a he was a businessman, and you know he had the mentality that I needed in order to get back into the game and uh, really claim the losses. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, he pushed me mentally, even mm -hmm. if he, even though he didn't know um, a lot of, about trading, he pushed me mentally to continue to trade and uh, push myself and uh, yeah, get the uh, profits again. Mm. So uh, as part of your general rules, do you have, um, do you set position size limits for yourself as a percentage of your portfolio? And did, and if so, did you apply that initially when you first went into the trade in the pre-market? Yeah. So before uh, I entered the trade. I did have obviously the um, the set of rules and uh, the Excel sheet with all the when to enter and so on, um, how much to risk and all of those. But uh, what I realized in that matter of risk management is that I couldn't rely on the broker to continue to uh, give me this uh, six uh, time uh, buying power. So what I did is went back to the Excel sheets and then started to calculate everything again and give myself enough room uh, all the way to two times my uh, basically buying power. So the, those are the, these are the work that I did basically afterwards just to understand what really I can use or risk in any given uh, trade. I see. So. Uh... If you, if you were working with an account that had a maximum of two leverage, then would your position sizes all be smaller as a result? Yeah, definitely, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Started uh, smaller and adding less than, than what I did when I had mm -hmm. six time. I see. Uh, do, 
why did the broker change the amount of leverage that they uh, would allow you to use in the middle of the day? Uh, presumably, you hadn't received a margin call? No, no, didn't reach the margin call. It just changed it, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess, to everyone just mm. because the price melted down. So, you know, th there are times when the broker will say, okay, this is too volatile for me, and he cuts the, um, yeah, and he cut it. So I, I guess I see. It, it happens to everyone. I see. So it was because of that, of the, of the action of that particular security, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, I see. So it's just that particular security that they raise it. So summarizing, is there um, kind of what's the key takeaway traders can learn from your experience? Right. So in, in this matter of uh, the, the losing trade, mm -hmm. um, first of all, uh, make sure you have enough money in order to trade. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess, uh, number one. Of course, um, uh, you know, it's easy to say than done. Just stick to the rules. Every one of us, uh, the, the best trader in the world still, you know, some, from, some, from time to time, just uh, crossing the lines of the rules. But I guess uh, first, risk management starts small. You know, back in the when I first started in the pre-market that trade, I should have covered before the opening bell, basically. But for some reason, I this I don't like to call it greediness, but let's call it greediness. Of, you know, I'm sure she's gonna it's gonna continue up, and yeah, just stick to the rules. I guess would be the the right action. Mm. Do you have a recommendation on uh, typically what percentage of one's total capital uh, would be advisable not to risk more than um, on any given trade uh, and or um, percentage of uh, risk uh, typically to, to yeah. keep you to keep one relatively safe? Yeah, so I so I guess you know the, there's the, the default rule of uh, one percent out of your account for uh, per trade. What I usually do is basically uh, set myself a daily loss limit, and from there I just cut it by um, the type of trade. Okay, so if let's say I have uh, a plus trade, you know the the best setup that I could ever really ask for, then I will risk around 40% of my daily loss on it. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a, it's a B setup, I would risk around the 20%. So in that way, what usually, at least what I recommend is just go and set up a daily loss that you can uh, live with. And there is also this rule of uh, three uh, daily loss limits. So let's say if I'm risking $100 a day, what will happen to me mentally if I will lose uh, three times this daily loss? So mm -hmm. after three days, I'm down three hundred dollars. Or is it affecting me? Uh, am I losing it, or I can still control myself and get back to the game? So just try to find the right balance between the mental side of it and um, what you have in your account, like capital-wise. I see. We have a question from uh, Tessa. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, Michael. Uh, hi. Those are great tips. I was wondering, at what point did you were you able to scale up, and and how? I mean, that's that's another challenge too. Uh, yeah. Besides risk management, then then how do you scale up? Okay. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it took me a while to scale up. I was um, a good trader for many years that made his money, you know, to pay the bills and all of that, no Ferraris, just uh, making a living, a nice living out of it. And the reason I didn't scale up is because I felt, you know, finally I found um, the right spot for me, right? I know what I'm doing, I'm making X amount, I'm good with it. You know, there are obviously good months or bad months, but overall I'm good with where I'm at. And so it it takes um, extra courage, I guess, to 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 start scaling up and moving from that uh, comfort zone. 
So it took me a while to do that. And when I did that, it was again because of the same friend that I told you about uh, with the big loss. He actually took me and said, okay, you know this, you, you know what you do. He saw my trades and all of that. We talked about it a lot, although he didn't understand completely what it, you know, what is trading. He didn't trade, but he understood the, um, the mental side of performance. And he was sort of like a coach to me, basically. So we said a lot, uh, we talked a lot, we talked a lot, and basically he gave me um, the right push in order to start scaling in. I knew technical, technical wise how to do it and um, how to manage that risk and all of those things. But performance wise, I was in a good spot. So I didn't want to extend or try to, you know, get in out of my comfort zone, basically. So he gave me a kick in the ass. And uh, I'm sorry, is that okay to say that? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, sorry. And um, yeah, from that, from that moment, I, I did push myself and started to scale in, uh, scaling out properly and basically increasing dramatically like uh, five times more than what I made uh, on any other uh, month. I started to make a lot more just because it was there pushing me. Mm. Uh, uh, technical wise, you know, we need charts to talk about it and to really see um, how we can work it out. But basically, you know, when you add in, again, I'm mostly I'm adding, when I'm adding, I'm adding to a, a losing position, averaging down. So let's say I entered, I buy the dip. So, and I entered on a nice support level. The price dropped down, reached a major support level, volume coming in, increasing at the bottom all of those things. And then I'm entering with a quarter of my position, let's say 10% or 20% depends on the type of the, uh, of the trade. And then when it's, it dropped down again, what I'm doing is, is recalculating, understanding what I can add, how much um, money and uh, quantity I can add to that position. And what I'm looking for is the same rules again. So let's say if I'm looking for when the price is dropping down, reaching, uh, closing the gap of yesterday or six months ago and uh, increased volume coming at the bottom, I look for the same patterns and the same behavior as I did when I first entered and mm -hmm. then add into that position. When I'm adding to a long position or not a long position, um, a winning position, I'm a positive position. So what I'm doing is basically kind of doing the same, but waiting for, let's say I bought the bottom, it popped up. I'm waiting for a retest, like a pullback and then adding more to that and so on. Is there, uh, would you be able to share with us uh, on the screen um, some charts, uh, either prior charts or even a live chart uh, to show us a little bit visually of what you're talking about? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, sure. Do you want to do it now? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, great way to okay, let, continue this. Let me just uh, upload the the platform. Okay. So, uh, do you want to talk about specifically um, um, uh, trading strategy, like uh, say, or say. trend following? Maybe. Uh, are there a couple, a few stocks um, even today or in the last few days that you might be able to pull up and you can show examples of, of kind of what you're looking for, anything yeah. that looks interesting from a long or short position and why? Okay. So uh, today I traded the BABA and uh, PDD. Those are two uh, Chinese companies. The whole sector was crazy. Mm -hmm. And again, I... I basically saw them popping up uh, through the scanners. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, also uh, all their electrical uh, vehicles was also moving strongly. So uh, my main focus was on that. Although, like I said uh, previously, we, you can stick to the 
just stick to the um, queues and and queue uh, the queues and the spy, and you can easily uh, do well. I don't know easily, but yeah, do well. Okay, so um, let's say on the BABA, and I will post the the trade. I will post it in in our uh, community. Mm -hmm. in chat with traders community uh, later on uh, i actually got out much earlier than than what i should i guess because it popped up all the way to 88 i see now so i bought it first uh right here you will see it on the this is a thing called swim uh, charts so you will see it on my charts um, uh, when i will upload it to the community i'm not in my uh, desk at the moment so this is why i don't have the trading platform here but basically i bought it you will see it later on i bought it here at the beginning what what do you see bullish there like what what do yeah. you see in the charts okay so first uh, this is baba on a one minute chart mm -hmm. it popped up gapped up uh, after news coming uh, from china and uh, that was kind of a classic uh, move just to retest the just to retest the um, highs of the pre-market right so it's it bounce up retest the the pre-market highs and basically i took long uh, very momentum kind of uh, move looking for a, a, a bullish momentum move uh, the whole sector in this case was very uh, strong they all uh, the, all the chinese uh, companies opened with a gap up and uh, and you know the momentum was there so i aimed for a nice move a quick move to the upside i did took that um exit covered some of it here and then when i started it's consolidating you can see of course uh, low volume while consolidating so sort of like a, a bull flag coming in and i saw that the others the other um um in this the other sector or basically the other uh, stocks from from that sector also still looking pretty bullish so i entered uh, again here or actually uh, added more to my position so this is similar to pulling back right so it bounced up instead of pulling back with the price it's pulling back or moving sideways creating a a, a sideways pullback mm -hmm. and uh, consolidating and added more here when and so when here, so we're uh, quick covered. when you uh added more uh there uh was how much of your decision to add more was based on the other chinese stocks uh remaining uh quite strong and that you felt that the sector would it would pull up alibaba and that this could represent good support area yeah that, it was a mix of both definitely because uh, i had on the other uh, screen i had uh baba pdd neo those kind of stocks mm -hmm. and i saw that they going or at least uh, thought that they are going to continue because they all looked pretty much the same they they opened differently but the momentum if you look at the chart on a one minute like one minute especially at the beginning of the day you can see you can see the level two on the chart on the like the bars the the candles because you see the momentum you see how fast the the buyers are coming in and pushing the price up or down all of those uh, small nuances so as soon as i saw that the other companies are doing the same and baba was pretty strong uh, from the get-go then i understood that i need to jump in and you know and you do have the pattern and they tried to push the price down couldn't reach that uh, high of the of the day and basically with nice volume coming in when moving up and the low volume as consolidating while well consolidating then it was uh, the right moment for me to enter and say okay i'm willing to take a risk on that trade mm -hmm. okay great and so you entered it and entered uh, on the long side a second time and where do we go from there yeah so i just covered as soon as it reached the the 85 I uh, started to cover and basically from that point <laughs> you can see it went a long uh, way from where I exited but yeah 
I covered it, uh, the 85, started to see volume coming in, increased volume coming in at a resistant level, 85 round number. Um, also, the other stocks was a little bit fishy. The, the market went down. So I took my, uh, took my trade and basically closed it. Mm -hmm. But it still was a nice trade, still uh, almost $3. So, yeah. Well, great. Mm -hmm. well, great. You know, when looking back, you can see, of course, that it went up. And most traders would say, okay, well, you could have made a lot more. But, you know, I only had this candle when mm. I saw it live. So, <laughs> mm. enough. How often do you place a trailing stop loss orders and just kind of let it run, do its thing? Mm. You know, um, yeah, when I was... Let's let's call it a conservative trader. You know, when I played by the rules, I used to be a very systematic trader. So um, I back in the days I, I developed a, a software, a tool that is uh, integrating with interactive brokers the, through API, and basically I used to set all my uh, orders through that um, program, the software that I developed. And that was um, automatic, automatic managing trades uh, platform. So basically, what I did is just enter in my uh, my entry price, then uh, my stop loss, and from that point, the um, the software did everything for me. So um, trailing stops and splitting my uh, my shares into few stop losses. So I used to enter with one order of stop loss, and then when it reached a certain um, a milestone, then it split it, my stop loss into two or three uh, stop loss orders. And basically that was a very long time in my trading that I used to trade and with that. So basically I didn't manage the trade. Um, at the same time that I had that friend that gave me the, the performance push, I started to become a much more... Um, discretionary trader right and first of all I, I love it i don't know why i didn't do it before it's much more fun to trade as a discretionary trader than a systematic trader and um yeah so so today i'm not using anyway today i'm not using uh, trailing stops mm -hmm. so uh you mentioned about your friend uh sound and who was a good mentor uh, toward you uh, during the time of a big loss. Uh, have you always traded alone? And uh, have you ever uh, traded with people, with fellow traders, or um, been involved in any kind of uh, trading groups? Yeah, so, um, you know, we talked about it, uh, of course, before, but um, probably uh, five or six years ago, I, I became a uh, head trader of um, a Nostro company, uh, basically a prop trading company in Tel Aviv. And just before that, I used to like coach and mentor other traders, just uh, like a one-on-one. -on -one. And when I started to trade with the, with the prop, then of course I had a lot of traders coming in and out. And so I saw a lot of traders, I saw a lot of, um, you know, behaviors, different behaviors of, uh, of a trader, uh, traded, of course, every day with them. So, uh, yeah, that was a very good time for me. Mm. So you, you traded with this company as a fellow trader where are, um, just like anyone else or sorry, or were you working there as a, did you say manager? Sorry. Yeah. I actually helped to build that, um, the whole, um, uh, Nostro department or basically the, the prop department and then I was the head of the traders so traders came in and start uh, started to trade with us um, we said we had a nice uh, big office we sat there every day traded uh, doing the analysis before like pre-market prep doing the recap uh, trade recaps after that um, journal trading journal all of those things so we did that together. It was much different than what we what I experienced before when I set it on by myself. 
mm -hmm. as a retail trader. I see. So prop firms, from my understanding, prop firms are known for where traders get an, a chance to trade with other people's money, uh, presumably kind of nameless, kind of faceless money rather than trading their uh, friends and family money. Was right. that the case at this particular case too? I mean, traders could. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You would have, uh, you, you came, you paid uh, X amount of fee in order to, in order for us to evaluate you. And if you pass, we funded um, your account basically. So um, instead of trading your own capital, bring from uh, you know the money that you saved, uh, then you basically got funded and started to trade on our capital. And we sat together, um, you know, talked about it, talked during the trading session, talked about it before, after. It was really it was really intense and all in in the trading uh, part and, and that is a great thing to have oh. i see uh it looks like do we have any questions from the audience yeah i've got one um you know i watched one of your videos and you made a comment saying you you don't use level two you said something about a five second chart instead i Guess I'd like your opinion on level two and time and sales. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's a that's a great question. Um, I guess I'm in minority here, right? Because most traders, at least that you listen to on YouTube and stuff, are, are talking a lot about level talking a lot about level two. Uh, for some reason, for me, I I just didn't do that from from the beginning i didn't uh, try to use level two um for me i mean i know the reasons for, for me first of all i knew that there are a lot of spoofing uh, you know a lot of algos they're trying to manipulate the price in the level two also uh, you only see limit orders right and um, and today you can easily hide them you can use uh, ice uh, iceberg orders or you can use Eden so basically even though even if I have a limit order you won't see it because I'm using uh, Eden order so you can't really see it on level two uh, so and the other part was that like in a chart right when you're looking at the chart you don't really uh, you can't really look at a, a specific uh, time frame in the chart right and then this make a decision you have to see the whole picture you have to go if you're looking on a one minute chart you need to go back all the way from the beginning of the day even if you are trading you know the the last 30 minutes of the day you will still go back to the beginning of the day understand what happened what was the price action who controlled the the price right now and controlled it before and then you make a decision right you won't see uh, a bull flag and just jumped in you jump in you need to understand what happened before the same is with level two if you want to use level two you got to understand what happened before the specific moment that you're looking at right now you under you basically need to look at the level two from the beginning of the day even if it's um, 12 p 12 uh, p.m right now and you want to make a trade you got to understand what happened in the price before that so it's like a chart basically level two you can look at it like a chart but you need to see the full picture so this is why i i don't really uh, like using it and the spoofing and all of the uh, manipulation that occur in there what i what i do instead i'm using a five second chart so basically instead of looking just on a one minute i would look for i would look also at a one minute um, five second chart and basically you would have seen the same thing right you will see a lot of uh, support and resistance like tiny support and resistance and all those things that you supposed to get from level two but that actually occurred in the price and on your chart that's at least you know my my take on that oh. okay do you watch time and sales at all and can you get the five second chart on thinkorswim or do you have to use a tick chart and, and what i do is um, on a five second chart i use my uh, interactive brokers 
I'm not sure. Maybe Trading View have also uh, the option to do that, but I use it at least in in uh, interactive. Uh, regarding the time and sale, I do look at it, but not giving it maybe enough um, enough uh, you know focus. I don't know. I just didn't start trading with those things, and I guess in time. I found myself focusing more of the of the movement of the chart. Like I said before, in the like on in a one minute chart on, on an active asset, on an active stock, you will see on a one minute chart the the way it reacts, the, the way the bar, the, the uh, real time bar reacts, and you can understand a lot from it just by looking uh, at that candle in my perspective. So uh, I guess, of course, it's a lot of hours that I spent looking on those things, but um, eventually you, you will see stuff that you that probably will be enough important or enough good for you, good enough for you, um, regardless if you're looking at the level two in time and sale. Uh, we have a question from the audience um, from BJ Patel. Uh, could you elaborate on your software? Is it available to others? Um, he likes the idea of automatically splitting your trail orders, which takes time to do manually. Uh, unfortunately, or or fortunately, I sold that uh, platform mm. uh, three years ago. So, yeah, so it's not available. Not that I know. I, I actually not in touch with the guys that bought it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and. Yeah, unfortunately, we've ran out of time. Uh, our hour is up, but uh, uh, we'd love to have you back on the show. And how how do listeners uh, get in touch with you? I mean, you're inside our community, but as well. But um, uh, what do you do now, and and how can listeners reach out to you and learn more about you? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I'm happy to be again on the show. I loved it, and I'll be happy to share more and more. Um, currently. As some of you know, I'm uh, the CEO of Trader Pool, and we are a prop firm, online prop firm. So anyone can try to uh, go through our evaluation phase, pay an X amount of fee, and if we uh, manage to reach the goal and you know stick to the the rules, we uh, fund him. Um, I I'm trying to be as active as I can in the community, and I will be uh, posting. Uh, trades that I made or uh, some of our traders uh, that uh, will make uh, trades as well. And of course, some analysis and some uh, hot stocks that I'm watching and all of those things. Uh, so feel free to reach out, ask me anything. Uh, I'll be happy to help. 